So the arts program in and of itself, you know, I feel that there's some uh, misunderstanding with definition with the arts. Many people say, no, it's theater, or it's choir, or it's band, or it's some combination of the three. But what really are the arts? The arts in and of themselves, as Mr. Miller so kindly illustrated, that they are an outlet of creativity. They are in and of themselves oh, an outlet for those who can otherwise express themselves. So having heard that, I'd like to take a poll. How many of you enjoy the arts in some form? You either support them or you, you know, some, somewhere along the lines, you guys enjoy the arts. All right, so that's all of you. Different question. How many of you view that the arts, that say like a theater class, is on par with a science class in importance? Everyone who is not raising their hand, I'm literally hating you right now. <laughs> but it's an important question because the majority of you raised your hands, but 40% of America is with those who didn't. In high schools, 40% of high schools in America do not have a fine arts requirement. You can go through all of high school without having to participate in any form of fine arts. Now, for me, being a theater person, I've been in theater since I was in sixth grade, and I've been in the theater department all four years of my high school career. And for that scares me, because I know what it does, and I've seen how much good does come from theater. So. I do what I've done for a long time, and, um, and see, whenever I'm presented with a problem, my dad, I mean, he's kind of a combination of a lot of things, and he's, and he's always pressed with us, that, or at least with me and my brother, that I should always look long term. He says, Garrett, play what if. Now I know you're saying, what is what if? Well, what if is saying, if this happens, what will be the cause and effect of that? If the arts programs, say, are less important than regular classes, what will happen to the arts? And if it doesn't happen at the high school level, then it will go to a college level. And once it's gone to the college level, where will it go from there? What will happen? What if, if you take nothing away from what I say today, please take away this. What if? If the arts are gone, what ends up happening to everybody? What ends up happening to me? What ends up happening to you know, anybody else who has been touched by the arts themselves? So the first thing I'd like to address is really you, you can't argue the importance of the arts without understanding the value of the arts. And we all know that creativity is a big part, but the something else that I think comes from the arts that people don't really understand is very much a trust issue. When you're on stage with somebody, you have to trust them unconditionally. It is not something that you have to, if you have doubt that you do it, you will not perform well with that person because you're constantly afraid that they're gonna miss their line or you're afraid that they're gonna be off pitch or you're afraid that they're not gonna deliver that measure properly. Um, a perfect example of that is when uh, I'm part of the uh, high school's comedy sports program. And what that is is that it's a comedic improv where we take suggestions from the audience and we incorporate them into the games. So I had this one example, it was just during like kind of a, a theater thing, and I was on stage with one of my good friends, his name is Reed Buck, and of course being Reed Buck, we were two crazy characters, and we were, we were actually both um, stereotypical cheerleading pr people. So it was all, you know, it's like, oh, Jessica, stop, no, stop. Oh, oh, did you hear that? Oh, hashtag yellow swag. You know, you're doing all that kind of stuff. So, then at some point, I didn't know what happened, but I broke character. I went from going sounding like this to sounding like this. And it terrified me for a second. I'm like, oh my god, I just broke character. I broke character. And Reed, instead of freaking out, he stood there and he said, Jessica, why did you just sound like a guy just then? I'm like, I, I don't know, Sarah. I was just kind of, you know, doing my thing, you know. And she's like, wait, so are you a dude? <laughs> and needless to say, that's what happened. But the importance of this example isn't that Reed saved my butt, it was that he took a scenario and he said, and he knew that I would pick it up as soon as he gave me that offer. We both trusted each other 100% inquisitively that if any of us make a mistake on stage, we just pick it up right there and we keep going. So 
from that standpoint, you create these trusts with people. There are people that I have met through the theater department who I'm still friends with today and who I would give a leg, arm, and a hand to if I had to. Those people, they, they are. They, they become your family, and you stand by them no matter what happens. So then comes the other part where, you know, yeah, you could say, you know, yeah, okay, the arts are important. They are important, so they should be in curriculum. They should be taught, say, English class, or maybe history, if you want to go to the extravagance of you know, how important they are. Well, that's doing it a disservice. Yes, on paper, it sounds fine. You know, I'm sure everybody in this room has experienced reading Shakespeare in English class at some point, and you can understand how incredibly boring it is. I'm a theater person. I love acting Shakespeare, but I'm telling you, when you're reading it on the page, it is death. It is awful. You sit there, and I just do. I, sit, I do. I sit there, and I go, let this be over. For the love of God, let this be over. Because I'm not, you're, you're not engaged in the material. The reason why Shakespeare is so great is not because he put you know, everything in I Am a Pentameter. It's not because he used symbolism that nobody else used before. The reason why he's great is because he can make you feel things that you can't feel any other way. Perfect example, McBee. Probably the darkest play you will ever read. It's, a, it's literally conspiracy and everybody dies. <laughs> so the thing with... I didn't think that was going to be funny. Uh, this, this, the thing with the whole show, what is Macbeth about? It's about guilt. It's about guilt for killing the king. It's about guilt for killing the sons. It's about guilt for killing Banquo. It's all about guilt. But the reason why it's timeless is not because the witches symbolize fate. It's not because McBee is symbolizing the hum human ambition. It's because it's very real. It's because Macbeth in of itself, if you were put in that situation and you had the temptation to change something, you could, you, all you had to do was kill one person to get where you've, what you've always wanted, what would you do? That is why Macbeth is timeless. That is why Macbeth is a classic. And that is why Shakespeare is great, because you end up sympathizing with him. You end up sympathizing with a murderer who literally, he comes out and he just pours his heart out at the end. I shouldn't have done it. I'm so sorry. But he can't apologize because it's done. And you end up sympathizing with somebody. That in and of itself is just, it's, for me, it's mind-boggling. How can I sympathize with a man who literally killed four people just because he wanted to be king? It's something to be taken back at. So to see these things and to see is, is something that's very necessary. And something else that I really uh, feel very strongly about with this is that from a historic perspective, I'm a historical person, I love history, but there's some things that history can't tell you. What I mean by that is that they can, you can read all about how influential Bach or Beethoven was, but you don't understand how influential they are unless you hear them. We have very unique historical opportunity with the arts because you literally can go back in time. You can hear what someone in 1720 heard. You, could, you can literally feel what someone in Elizabethan England felt when they watched Shakespeare. If you're hearing a classical choir doing an Italian ballad, you, can, you, you feel that. You hear it. You get to experience what somebody hundreds and hundreds of years ago could experience. And that is something that you can't capture in a history textbook. It's, it's just... It's uncapturable by words. You have to experience it. So with all that being said, I'm a person who, you know, yes, I pointed out a problem, but how do you fix it? So obviously, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is money. It's funds. Yes, funds are important, but arguably the most important thing in order to save the arts from being taken away from even more in schools is we have to come together as a community and create, as what Mr. Jason Stone said, our uh, head of the band. He said that you have to create a philosophical base for the arts. You have to take the arts themselves, and everybody has to agree that they're important. Because even if they have all the funding in the world, it will mean nothing if nobody comes. It will be empty if 
you know, the band gets all new equipment, or the theater gets a new set, or the choir gets new music, if people just dismiss it as useless, as something that's old fashioned and out of date. So, with regards to the arts, there are some things, as with most things, that you have to be, they're, they're more or less an acquired taste. And the arts have touched a significant amount of people. And I know I wouldn't be best friends with a certain somebody in the audience if it was not for the arts. Because God knows I probably wouldn't have the social skills to come up and talk to her either. So I was watching The Monuments Men the other day. I don't know if you've ever watched it, but it's a fantastic film. And the premise of the movie is that there was a band of United States soldiers fighting World War II, and they're out literally to save the art of Europe. And there's this one part of the movie where George Clooney gives an amazing speech, and the gist of it is, he says, you can destroy a person's home, their cities, and their government, but the second you destroy their culture, their history, what makes them who they are, it's permanent, and it's scarring, and they lose sight of who they were. So maybe the question is not why should we do it, it's why shouldn't we do it. The question then becomes if we are to better understand ourselves, we must understand who we were. Shakespeare said all the world is a stage. I beseech all of you, let's keep it that way. <laughs>